Um, can I just welcome you all? I've met most of you, I think, or I've, I've emailed you or spoken to many of you. Um, if not, I'm President Gordon Morrison, President of Stork Valley Rotary Club. Normal Zoom rules will apply. All screens will be muted at the start of the call. And uh, during questions after the talk, I will, I will scan all screens looking for raised hands. Uh, the, the chat box is available if you wish as well to get my attention. Now, it's been our custom uh, to ask Peter Blaskos, who celebrated his 90th birthday last week. Uh, we're not going to let you forget it, Peter. <laughs> so Peter's going to give us his words of wisdom before, before we start. Yeah. Yes, good evening. Yes, let us give thanks for our meeting online. Normally, we get the system just fine. But tonight, because of computer elves, we nearly had to talk amongst ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> However, Robert will tell of steps he has taken to maintain his local firm producing bacon. Because there's nothing like the smell and anticipation when bacon is frying for your delectation. Very good. <laughs> Very good. Thanks. Well done, Peter. Well done. Well done. Very good. And on, on the hoof as well. <laughs> the light of the brain is still very sharp. <laughs> right, everybody. Um, I'm now delighted to introduce Robert Cannon, uh, who's our speaker this evening. <coughs> our plan earlier this year was for Robert to describe his very successful business to us and then to follow that up in the summer with a visit to his processing factory um, in Harlow. Now, how things have changed in such a short time. Peter will still describe his successful business, but link that to the devastating impact that COVID-19 has had on his business. So Robert, I'm now going to set your slides up. Um, that on my screen, but nobody else's. Hold on. Uh, oh, well done. Right. So you all, you've all seen it. Can all see the slides? Yeah. Yes. 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 Uh, Modigal, yeah. mute all. Who's <coughs> going to mute all the screens now? Apart from Robert. Okay. Golden? Yeah, we can hear you now. You've got me, have you? Yes. Uh, well, I can't hear a great deal, Gordon, here. So if you can hear, would you like to change the slide to slide two? Um, so um, A1 Bacon was formed by my father in 1979 as a shelf company. Um, it was uh, traded by myself several years later when we thought that unique aroma um, that Peter referred to was called the Millard reaction, which is a combination of 150 different amino acids, compounds, fats, sugars, to give us that delightful hook um, that we could make a business that people would really engage in. So I started trading from home originally in Brent Pelham, and in 1985, um, we uh, leased a factory in Stalk Mill in Harlow, which was a small starter unit. And then um, at the back of the recession, there was a factory that came up um, in 1989, which is actually the next slide, Gordon, if you wouldn't mind clicking on. Um, that was our first starter unit. And that's not how we left it, not as we operated it, but it's the most recent photograph. So then uh, we operated there for a number of years. Um, regrettably, my father passed away in 1993. But we had already looked at a site at Bush Fair in Harlow, which was um, a manufacturing site that had been redundant for some time. So as ambitious as it was uh, at the back of the 90 recession, we expanded and went into... Um, the site, uh, which I've got a picture of, a couple of slides on, just for reference. Um, 
but in that factory um we um uh, experienced uh, growth um to through to 1996 when bsc was absolutely catastrophic in the uk I'm sure you can remember all the pyres um it just absolutely decimated the meat industry in fact i have a picture behind me in my office here to remind me of that day um and then in 1997 we had uh, classical swine fever in the e economic community and foot and mouth disease in taiwan which was uh, again another uh, spike for raw material so if you could just change slides gordon um to the next Gordon, would you be able to change slides? Hello, is anybody receiving me? Right, Robert, sorry, my, my call was muted. Right, okay. We're Can now you just we're change now... slides? Yeah, so. Yes, we're now got the graph is, in front of um, us. A price of raw material prices during that time um, and the three big spikes on the graph show the three incidents of BSE, foot and mouth and swine fever as it was and where that took it away from normal the red line if you can see it is the average across the year across those years and the massive spikes and the disruption um, to day-to-day -to -day trade all cope with just in uh, normal normal business um, so Gordon if you want my changes of the sl slide on now so that was the third factory at Bush Fair and then again into the um, millennium slide change please um, so we have the bug if anyone remembers that the non-existent uh, catastrophe as it was at the time <laughs> everything yes. was going to stop working and in fact everyone just sailed through with with barely a glitch but at that time we did take a preventative measure um, to credit insure our business so any trade that we do has an insurance back policy providing we insure within the scheme um, to uh, enable us in the event of forfeiture or delinquency to claim 90% of the value back so we've been paying that ever since 2000 and again we had 2001 another foot and mouth crisis in the UK going on to the financial crisis, which I won't labor the point, but we can remember it was probably as bad as it feels at the moment, but not as bad as it's about to become. So um, just getting on with it um, through um, a normal, normal business operation. So slide change, Gordon, please. Okay. Um, so we now go into the tenses. Um, we thought at the back of that recession, as we'd moved uh, previously in the nineties, um, on the back of the financial crisis, it was a good time to um, to look to develop again. We were expanding and growing pretty continually, 10, 12, 15% a year. Um, and we were trawling Harlow as it was geographically convenient for the M11 and the motorway network around the southeast of England. Um, and we came across this site, uh, which we're, I'm in at the moment, we're in today. Um, and we completed October 14 on the new factory, which was 40,000 square feet, uh, one and a half acre site, quite ambitious, and undertook a significant building program to refurbish, convert the premises, which was a regional distribution center uh, for various manufacturers um, just outside the M25 uh, to a food premises. And while construction was in full tilt, we were running our business from our old site and we managed to um, relocate all machinery over the August bank holiday weekend and moved in August 2015. And then we had the delightful EU referendum um, on the 23rd of June, which had an impact on the currency overnight that Thursday to Friday. Uh, 131 to 124, it was very rapidly 120 the following week and the week after 117. And what this again did to commodity prices, it pushed it up 10% overnight, which was, which was an absolutely catastrophic period 
uh, of probably that quarter um, when we were locked into contracts that we couldn't renegotiate. Um, and in fact, the only contract we did renegotiate was the only one that subsequently withdrew from subsequent trade. Uh, that's how brutal this industry is. Um, so we, in 2017, we managed to dispose of the old factory, um, but we turned in our worst figures for five years. Um, in the new factory, decided to go off and learn a few more things about how we should be doing it at the Judge Business School in uh, Cambridge. It was very informative, very, very enjoyable, good engagement from the team. Um, and ASF, which was African swine fever, was just getting going in China. If you don't mind a slide change, Gordon, um, this will give you an idea of the extent of the factory refurbishment we undertook. And although it was an existing shell and crinkly tin, it was not really fit as a food premises anymore and totally overhauled. So the slide change, Gordon, please, um, shows you, now although that looks like a digital picture, that's actually a, a, a twilight picture um, at dusk, actually in operation, what we managed to turn the factory into. So as we thought, a 21st century operator um, producing food, wholesome, safe food as we wanted to produce it. And the next slide, Gordon, will just give you an example of um, how we do that today um, from intake in the first picture um, in hygienic packaging recycled so there's no waste at that point um, the production hall and the cleanliness that was actually august 15 that picture so we're not fully manned or machined or, or, or in operation but it gives you an idea of the standard um, the day-to-day -day operation and organization in slide three and some finished product where copious amounts of sold bacon of different denominations uh, for different uh, clients, different specifications um, across Great Britain. So it, it was work, working well. Um, it was the right decision to make at the right time. Um, I think I'll allude later on to the hindsight webinar um, <laughs> that uh, we could have all done with going on some years ago but uh, all the decision made at the right time for the right reasons um, and uh, just pulling on to to what's happened since so slide change Gordon if you don't mind so this comes up to uh, just showing you the raw materials again in the current era um, and we've actually put a COVID block for our own use um, how that's affected prices um, Basically, prices have fallen away to week 20. Um, if you read along the bottom axis, um, and then picked up again, and now they're above average um, because there's demand for product, even though we haven't got clients buying it because of shortage of supply. So the next slide, Gordon, Robert, um, will I show you the raw material um, at the animal stage. And this will just show you what's happened COVID. So if you go up from about week eight um, to a plateau, and then it's about nine weeks of falls down to uh, at the bottom of the market. It's just come back again, stabilised at 166 euros to the kilo for a dead weight uh, pig. Um, but again, it's just above historical averages, but way below expectation of two euros a pig. Um, in the current global um, demand. Um, so just overlapping that slide change, Gordon, to 19, uh, sorry, 2019, um, just gives an idea of the, uh, where we were at um, due to Brexit vote um, that, we, that we had, um, which we we're planning forward to in quarter one that year, um, 31st of March, um, one of our largest customers in Ireland had been taken over and um, due to their Brexit procurement plan we lost that work um, which wasn't very helpful that put us back about 15 tonne a, a week um, very hard to replace 
um, the anniversary that year of African swine fever. Now the significance of a 12 month anniversary um, is that they have to be, countries have to be 12 months free uh, without disease before they can be declared um, infection free. And um, that has not happened in China yet. So we're into the second year of, of that global draw. Uh, Brexit too was um, October, as I'm sure you can remember. Um, and then finally, we thought after all this lurching about all over the place, we finally had some clarity. Uh, the blue corner won the election. Christmas seemed good after all. The housing market was taken off. And um, all that certainty that was around just before Christmas um, very readily turned on the next slide, Gordon, if you don't mind. Um, it started off the year very well for me. I had a lovely trip to Athens in February. Global travel with a massive airport at Athens with no people. Uh, sporting events I went to was football uh, in the Midlands, rugby at Twickenham, followed off by the Cheltenham Festival on the 13th of um, March, which I called that they shouldn't have hosted because of COVID, um, but it went ahead anyway. I think purely economic reasons, the amount of investiture in the training of the animals for three months and how it was all laid on. Um, and returning back to work on the 16th of the 3rd, Monday morning, our processing numbers, we, we'd actually sold 61 tonne of product for delivery the next day. So that's three articulated lorry loads of product, all sold, all on normal terms, no adverse effect to the market yet, trading as normal, um, returning from that trip, I was elated to see those sorts of sales figures. Um, but through that week, um, the orders were rescinded. Product we'd already sent out had been returned. Um, claims for credit and payment were coming in from all over the place. Um, so we were literally firefighting for our lives. Um, uh, we had contact from um, uh, William Morrison's and we did um, uh, a 24 hour packing job and we supplied 65 ton of retail bacon uh, early on when people were buying 50% more food and they couldn't cope in their own organisation. So it, was, it helped us, it helped them, it helped the country. We felt like... Um, as essential workers, we were feeding the country and we did our bit, but everyone was absolutely exhausted and we couldn't see much of a future in, in April. So we furloughed all our staff uh, the, on the 31st of March. And that proved to be the right decision because there was just nothing around. Um, in, in, in April, we achieved 5% of our normal business from frozen produce that we had just uh, stored to uh, prevent anything perishing. And in May, we were manufacturing. We have got small teams back from 75 staff that we had. Um, I think we've now got 35 to 40 back in the business, um, pretty much full time, but on restric restricted duties. Um, 25% of normal business in May and if we can get to June to back to 40% that you know they'll be encouraging um, it's not there yet but we've still got furloughed staff we've got Sybil's loans to support in the meantime um, and it's it's difficult to be optimistic but we're on a lot surer footing than we were previously so we're trying to support people and jobs and incomes and families. So the furlough scheme is the best thing we can possibly do, but we do know we are staving off some really brutal decisions, both for the business and for those families. Um, but I, I just think, don't think we can be um, naive or, or, or blinker to the fact that this is coming. I just strongly believe it's getting worse economically before 
certainly our business or sector becomes uh, better um, and, and it's, it's going to be really, really painful. So we're just trying to do our best for everyone currently. So we've now got Brexit 4 to look forward to with the heightened cycle of procurement, stocking, ordering uh, and um, uh, product uh, manipulation as want of a better word uh, distorting markets and um, at the moment with negotiations going to the wire and the grain of brinkmanship uh, at the moment we've been informed that we will have uh, notifications of tariffs in the event of a no deal on imported goods which will affect our uh, raw material input so the whole idea of our business over the last four decades of um, importing cheaper meat uh, from Europe uh, is likely to go. So again, the future looks rather bleak, but we're doing our best. So um, I apologise for the, um, the technology this evening, uh, but it just shows you in the real world the difficulties that we are you are facing. Thank you, Gordon. Thank you, Robert. It's a, it's a tough story to tell, mm. and thanks for sharing that with us. Um, would you be up for a few questions? Yes, absolutely. If I can hear them, I'll try and be as open as I can, but not financially confident, no, no. discreet, obviously. No, 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 no. Thank you. Right. Let me just get on the screen sharing. Right. Is there any questions? Robert, uh, Richard Beasley. Hello, we Richard. Need to, we need to unmute you, Richard. Just hold on a sec. Yes. Can you can you hear me? Yes, you're you're on, Richard. Okay. Can you hear me, Robert? Yes, I can, Richard. Good evening. Good evening, Robert. That was really absolutely fascinating. Um, for people like myself, now we read the newspapers, we pay attention to the media. But the reality of what it is that you've experienced, um, not just in the last three months, but over the last 10 plus years and the issues with which you've had to deal is uh, really quite astonishing. And I'm, I'm just hugely impressed that um, you, you can deal with this kind of volatility. Um, nobody has any idea what the future is going to hold. But no. what about the rest of the industry? Are, are you all in the same situation or are some structurally in better shape than others? Well, this is what's not, thank you, Richard. That, that this is what's not becoming apparent. I think the, um, the delinquency is, is just hidden at the moment. I think when the uh, furlough scheme uh, conditions change at the end of July um, and start to, um, be less sorry uh, August become less favorable um, I mean arguably it's been too generous that uh, I've interviewed someone today that wanted early retirement then he doesn't because he's quite happy on 80% on furlough and um, you know they've, they've had quite a good job and I, I've explained to the man that you, you know you're rather detached from reality that you've been protected, we've had this beautiful weather, you've done all your jobs, you've got all your housekeeping in order on 80% pay and not working. But, you know, we've really been at the cliff face here. Um, you know, it, it's, it, it's a, it's a, looks very ominous. Nice. So to answer your question more specifically, hospitality has not returned. We thought there would be an uptake on the 1st of June, uh, once we got um, some skeleton staffing back. But it's a bit like the airline industry. It's, it's one thing flying an aircraft. It's a different thing flying it full with people, bums on seats. So whether you're a pub, a hotel, um, a restaurant, a cafe, you know, events that haven't happened this year will not happen. That's just gone forever. Uh, Wimbledon's been insured, but will not happen. Glastonbury's gone. Uh, Carnival Cruises, I'm sure you may have seen the share price, absolutely plummeted. They won't sell boats now until October. Um, I can't see the hotels in London, even if they're open. Who, the type of 
visitor this year. It's not going to be the Americans. It won't be the Chinese. So I just can't see the business coming back. And my colleagues uh, in the industry, if you're in a catering butcher, um, you know, we hear that out of hundreds and hundreds of people, they've got one site open with skeleton staff of maybe 12 or 20 people, um, you know, with a couple of vans, just keeping the business open. It's that bad. Yeah. And um, yeah. when customers cannot pay on their reopening, this is when it's really going to sort the men from the boys. Yeah. Thanks, Robin. Could I invite Peter Latham to uh, for a question? I'm just trying to unmute you, Peter. <coughs> right, you're unmuted, Peter. You know. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, thank you, Robert. That was um, quite fascinating, and uh, I was um, quite impressed with your way in which you've uh, addressed what I believe is the reality that none of us have quite frankly faced up to yet. Um, my my uh, question to you uh, concerns your business. It, is it does it just so happen that your business model, the uh, the customers you have, are the ones that are suffering? Because as a, someone who's somewhat distanced from the uh, front line as you are clearly on, uh, it seems that the food industry is one of those that probably came out of this uh, crisis not well, but better than others. Uh, is there something which is particularly um, uh, troublesome to you? You did mention uh, supplying the hospitality industry. Is, is this what uh, the problem is with your business at the moment? You know, good question. I, I may have skipped that in my haste to get the, uh, the time frame. Uh, um, basically, our uh, sector of operation is food service. So this is about out of home market. So this is people um, at their convenience, um, grabbing things on the hoof as they're going in their day to day busy lives. And also um, uh, hotels, cafes, um, we, we, uh, Centre Parks is a customer. Centre Parks are not open until the 15th of July. And then with distancing, schools are going back, but the canteens are not open. So catering isn't happening in its pre-COVID form. Um, and it's the fact that we are not a retail packer specifically. Food has been doing very well. There was 50% more food sold uh, in April. And this was for people bulk buying, freezing at home. In May, they've now got to clear the freezer and use the food they need to pay for on credit. Uh, and there was equally as much thrown away. But the at-home market, yes, is very, very busy. We're the away from home or out of home market. And that's uh, just, it's just stopped dead. So that, that's the big difference there. Thank you. Robert, <coughs> we have on the call, John Dennis uh, from Devon, who is actually one of your customers. <laughs> John, have you got anything to say? If I can find you, I'll, I'll unmute you. Um, oh, no, where's John Dennis? Oh, there we go. Hello, John. You're muted. Can you hear me? Yes, we can now. Yes, John. we can. Yeah. Hello, John. I don't know whether you know um, my company, Philip Dennis. Oh, of course we do. You're a regular, very yeah, good company. That's right. Oh, good. Um, How are you doing? Well, we're heavily involved in the food service sector as well. Um, we, we process fresh, fresh fish yes. and we process fresh meat. Uh, the fresh fish part of our business, we've closed completely. The fresh meat part of our business, um, we diversified into supplying the general public. Yes. Um, we've sold a lot. Well, we've sold a, 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 a quantity of product direct to the housewife. Um, the, the food service part, uh, the chilled and the frozen and the bacon sales to the hospitality sector, as, as you've outlined, totally, completely collapsed. Um, I'm quite impressed with your percentage figures. 
for my company, um, we're operating at the moment only on 15%. 15%. We went down to about 8%. Yes. It's now returned to about 15%. Well, I empathise, John. It's, you know, we, we need to go out and have some beers after this. Yeah, uh, we do. <laughs> <laughs> but my, my, my question is, the same to you, the same question that um, I charge myself every night with. Yes. Why didn't I, why wasn't I more involved in the retail sector, in supplying the retail sector, before this COVID um, or many years ago. Um, I, know, I know the reasons why I didn't, but I'd just be interested in the reasons why you didn't, presumably. Okay, you, well, look, it sounds like you, you might have been on that hindsight webinar, uh, John. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's why in the latter, later slide, you know, my, my life in February 2020 was normal. And I was traveling, you know, in Europe on budget airlines, going to big sporting events and doing everything I usually did. I didn't realize, you know, the day after the, I came back from Cheltenham, it was going to stop dead. Yeah. And although we had made provision to enter the retail market and we had some retail machinery, which we fully utilised um, with that Morrison's work. I mean, um, they were they were excellent. I would say as an operator, they um, they they were very ethical when the horse meat scandal was on because they've got their supply chains back to farm. Um, we just gave them our BRC certificate, double A grade um, in the new premises. They just took that and said, "Can you do it?" And we said, "Yes, we'd love to." Yeah. Um, accelerated payment terms and there wasn't a single label issue credit note or pound pack of retail bacon returned and arguably john this is no uh, nothing about you or your company but it was easier than the food service sector well um, ordinarily yeah. so we probably resisted going into retail because we thought how onerous it could be um, and that hasn't been our experience, but um, I would charge you with the fact that in February, nothing was wrong. Nobody had, has found themselves in this diabolical position through any error of judgment, poor decision making or malpractice. You know, it's just, it, it just occurred. Maybe if we'd known about this before Christmas from the government, what was coming, you might have been able to react slightly differently. But they too have been slightly reacting after the event. So I, I wouldn't challenge yourself there. There's just, you know, it's just, this is a global humanitarian yeah. phenomenon. I, I just wonder whether a couple of years ago, you, you don't feel that your company should have um, gone towards the retail market at that, at that time. Um, well, there was, there's some big players out there that, and everyone wants that big juicy <laughs> business, John. Oh. Um, we did buy some machinery two years ago um, when we moved into the factory and we thought that was partly from the Cambridge um, growth uh, challenge that diversification, specialisation and premiumisation was a way to go. Um, but, you know, there's a, there's, there, ordinarily there's a lot of meat consumed in this sector and... Um, yeah. Before Christmas, we were probably up about 250 to 300 ton a week, um, which is why we built the factory. So, again, it wasn't wrong six months ago, but yes, may, maybe we should have diversified more. But we, we have been making <coughs> contacts with people and we hope to open those up sooner rather than later. Yeah, Robert, if you only had that hindsight machine that the yes. media, <laughs> oh, yeah. media like, have. When I went over the side of the cliff, I think my crystal ball cracked and it's not working quite as well as it was. So, <coughs> Any other questions? We've got Will Gemmell on the, on the call who yeah. represents the food sector through Stratton Parker. Have you any comment to make, Will? I would just, well, my question, I suppose, would be to Robert. He's obviously been, but had built a very successful um, uh, business model based, it sounds like on importing um, pork meat, which is which is cheaper in places like 
uh, Denmark are big exporters of, of pork. Um, but I just wonder um, uh, whether you could restructure or whether it's just financially never going to be feasible to restructure to, to do it on British pork, or is that just simply um, wishful thinking? Uh, well, the short answer, yes, it's wishful thinking. Um, but the long, more, uh, the better answer would be, we are a red tractor approved plant. We pay for the audits. Um, we probably only sell one ton of red tractor per week. Um, but we cannot source the material in the UK, partly because everything that is labelled red tractor goes to um, the supermarket and the retail chains anyway, because we don't have the pig industry in the UK. So we, we are only about 40% self-sufficient on pork in the UK. So we yeah. do need the imports to make it work. But we don't know what that, if it's tariffs or no tariffs or deal or no deal, whether that will materially change it. And then you'll see over the next 10 years, the UK pig industry growing, without doubt. Thanks, Robert. Peter Blaskus has got a question. Yeah, mine was rather similar in that I always try and buy British meat if I can, or British anything. And it's usually quite a search in the supermarkets to find uh, certainly British bacon. And I'm wondering whether the, the markets of Holland and the Denmarks are unfairly subsidised by, um, by the governments as their greenhouses are with cheap gas. Um, and I, I wonder too if perhaps after Brexit, we'll all be a bit more uh, nationalistic and uh, try and buy British where we can and perhaps skew the market a bit better our way. No, it's good, good question. I, again, it's very complicated. Um, you know, whereas when I left school at 16 to set my business up, um, you know, people might have gone into some very vocational um, type trades. You know, the meat industry wouldn't have been one of those. Meat industry has been in decline for 40 years in the UK. Um, I'm involved uh, becoming last couple of years a freeman of the City of London. Um, through work with the Worshipful Company of Butchers, and they have a training uh, institute of meat that are trying to get people to join the meat industry. But it's, it's not very sexy. You know, we're an hour, well, no, less than that, 17 minutes on the train from Harlow into the, the tube network. So if people can go in and compute by, for an hour and go and sit in an office for double the pay in London and have a London life or come to Harlow for half the pay you know in mm. a factory that's cold and standing it's not a very attractive industry for, for the next generation they'd rather sit behind a PC anyway I would uh, being very generalistic but it's that's yeah, one thing about labor force and about the inclination to be a producer in the UK and the other thing is about the the structural industry I mean we buy meat from Europe partly because in Germany they want to knock over one point, about, about a million pigs a week. So if they're doing that a week, um, you know, there's, there's, there's 26, 30, 40 million pigs in their life cycles being bred just for the pork industry. Now we don't, we don't have anywhere near that in the UK. I can't remember what the UK numbers are. It certainly went down, it's coming back up again, it's certainly less than 300. So without the imports, we, we couldn't get the UK meat. And the people that will pay a premium are the supermarkets. People like Waitrose, a very good operator called Cranswick in the UK. Um, you know, they, they get their own pigs, they process them all, they don't come out onto the open market. So that's not really a, unless I wanted to get land, get pigs, you know, you can't, you can't um, pivot quick enough is the answer, short answer. Okay, could I invite one last question? Please. Peter Latham's got another question, I think. Um, yes, Robert. Um, there, there, there are two, really. Um, that are, the, the second one, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll say this one because um, it comes up from your last comment. Uh, you said that uh, your business isn't attractive, and I'm sure you mean that in two ways. One is that... Um, it flies against the niceties of uh, what a lot of people like to think is uh, is, is being a, 
a, a good person, uh, um, being kind to animals and all that sort of thing. The other is that um, it's probably um, not pleasant, some of the things that are required. But do you think that uh, the shock that the country is going to suffer over the next um, months and probably years is such that there's going to be a reassessment of uh, how we should approach life? Or is that well, uh, outside your area of concern at this time, bearing in mind uh, you've got to survive? Yeah, I mean, broader broader in the country you know people's bank accounts are diminishing but they're um you know with with things like mortgage and rent and rate holidays they've got that pain to come so i think people will have to change their view i mean we had we've had a couple of very good recessions it's fair to say we've expanded in both of them because at that time people res resort to value um, and comfort food, um, they won't, they will come down the offering a bit instead of the premiumization because of the lack of money. So that does become more attractive in the sector, but we're not, we're not seen as a profession. Um, you know, the meat industry with the animals and the beyond meat and the veganism and vegetarianism, flexitarianism, you know, we're on the back foot anyway. Um, but yes, I do. I do believe people will have to reassess. You know, it's family first, isn't it? Maybe ethics second. Um, but we we are uh, a well-tuned human by consuming meat. We're our most efficient at converting protein into energy into life, basically. So you've got all the complicated arguments about land water and animals but you can you might be able to save water and you've got methane and co2 as well so we, we're in a, we are in a totally different era we, we're not even rebalancing it are we we don't know what we've got and what we've got to work towards but yes it, everyone will have to readjust thanks very much robert um and obviously there's thousands of businesses around this country in very similar positions, so the future does feel very bleak. Um, can I just move on? Uh, Start Valley Rotary are now going to go on to a two weekly schedule for meetings. Our next meeting is going to be the Club AGM and therefore will be members only. But Tony Stringer from Rotary will be addressing the members and that will be published on YouTube uh, following the meeting. Um, for those of you who have not checked out our YouTube channel, I would recommend it. We've already had 300 visits. And uh, if you do visit, could I ask you to subscribe to the channel? Because we get a different status on YouTube when we achieve 100 subscribers. So that just leaves me to um, toast the Queen, Rotary, peace and health and prosperity the world over. Cheers, everybody. Mm. <laughs> Cheers.